Well, Lexi, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being here tonight. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm so excited. I love podcasts. I'm a podcast girl, so thanks. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Well, I mean, there, it's so fun to just like listen to them while you're like doing laundry and things like that. So I'm yeah, glad, yeah. I'm glad that we can connect and hear like real, real conversation. So year six for you, this is yeah. exciting. How are you feeling headed into this season year two with the sparks? Um, I'm just really excited. You know, like you said, this is year six, um, you know, making it into your sixth season, the WNBA is not easy. And, you know, there were moments in my career in the past where, you know, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to make it through this year or next year, you know, so to be at year six, I'm just really blessed and excited. Um, you know, this is my first season really with a solidified spot, you know, a role on the team prior to training camp. So just coming in to training camp this season, I have a completely different mindset. My confidence is through the roof. You know, I'm really excited to to learn from my teammates, you know, and, and they're looking at me as a veteran now. So, you know, I get to teach them a little bit. So I'm really looking forward to that. Absolutely. Talk a little bit about the mindset that you're going in with this year. Um, first and foremost, I want to be like the best shooter in the league. I would love for, to like have that title. Um, you know, that can come from my shooting percentage being a certain uh, number or, you know, just the respect I get from defenders. You know, I feel like I already am on my way to being, you know, one of the top shooters in the league. Um, and then just to, to change the culture culture of the Sparks organization you know mm -hmm. when I was growing up Sparks was like the pinnacle like that was the team like I remember when Candace Parker was there when you know they were going back and forth the Minnesota Lynx all those years in the finals you know the Sparks mm -hmm. were, were they were that team mm -hmm. um them in Minnesota so you know they've kind of fallen off a little bit you know we've had some internal changes but you know I think this season we have a really really good group new coaching staff is incredible um you know we've been in the gym the last two weeks together with you know some of the players and all of the coaching staff every day so mm -hmm. I'm really excited you know I think this time to like turn a new leaf for this organization and make you know the sparks an organization that people want to support and come play for I'm here for that that sounds that sounds awesome and you talked about a new coaching staff Kurt Miller is there um you played with for for him uh your first season so so talk about that reunion um was there a comfort knowing that he was coming? Like what, talk to me about that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, a little bit, you know, I think it was funny when they announced that Kurt was um, named the head coach. I had kind of predicted that that was going to happen after mm -hmm. they had lost in the finals. I figured that that team and the coaching staff, you know, were going to part ways after being together for so long. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't a shocker to me. My phone was blowing up because, you know, our separation after my rookie season wasn't like the prettiest um, or the most positive, but mm -hmm. you know, it was very professional and, and respectful. And that's what's important at the end of the day. So he's grown a lot. I've grown, you know, way more than he's grown, obviously. And you know, I was just 22 years old when, when we first met 23. Um, but it's been really nice to, you know, see him and, and show him who I am, who Lexi is now at 28 and how much I've matured and how much, um, you know, I've learned and, and experienced since, you know, we were together when he drafted me, obviously, mm -hmm. I think I'm thankful for him because he he's, he's the one who gave me my first opportunity in the W. So pretty much the entire coaching staff um, that drafted me is now in L.A. So um, for me, that is comforting because I don't have to really learn new personalities and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. I focus more on myself and, you know, helping out the young ones as much as I can. And so last year when you, you know, joined the sparks you're they really were looking for you three and D like that was, that was your, uh, role and you delivered <laughs> to say the least, has that been the focus of the off season, just kind of improving that getting, getting reps there, or has there been a different focus for you? Um, I know you mentioned looking to, to be the best shooter in the league, but what has that, what does that mean? Off season has looked like for you. Yeah. For me, off season is obviously just getting up a lot of reps shooting. You know, that's after a certain point in your career of shooting is just all about reps and confidence. So, you mm -hmm. know, just getting those reps up and, and just finding shots different ways, you know, just not depending on catching and shooting, coming off of down screen, stagger screens, but, you know, shooting a little bit more off the bounce transition. Mm -hmm. um, when Kurt was hired, you know, he called me a few days later and he let me know that he wants me to do more than just shoot threes. You know, he said, I kind of, have pigeonholed myself into a, a, a box of just having to shoot threes. And he's like, and you just, I've seen your growth as a player and you can do so much more than that. So, you know, coming off of screens, you know, mid range a little bit, being able to facilitate, bring the ball up the floor, 
Um, just not being just not being the shooter, but obviously I'm gonna continue to do what I do best, and that's shoot three. <laughs> That what a what a unique opportunity to have a coach kind of invite you into a space of of not being in a box because so often you hear coaches say, "Hey, this is your role. Don't stray from it. Like this is what I need you to do, and that's it." Yeah, and then Kurt's great. Like I've always respected him as a coach, even when I was a rookie, and you know, not really playing a ton. That he's still super brilliant. He loves, um, you know, watching film. He loves analytics. He's really a basketball nerd like me. So you know, we got along in that way, but. <laughs> You know, there is a role that we're all going to have, but, you know, this team is very different than the team he had in Connecticut. And I think he's really excited about the versatility of all of us, you know, mm -hmm. from one through five. Um, you know, I think he didn't really have any three point shooters in Connecticut for a right. few seasons. So he's really excited about that. <laughs> um, and I, I think we're all just really excited to have something new and have a change. You know, last year is kind of like a free for all, like do whatever. And he, that's just not how you win games in the W. So we're really excited to have a coaching staff and a head coach like her. That's amazing. And so, you know, focusing on reps and shooting in the, in the off season, um, you also stayed stateside this year. I know that you have played overseas and then you chose, um, the last two years to play athletes unlimited. Uh, tell me, tell me how those compare to each other and how, um, staying here this year has helped your game. I think um, I think it's a, I think it is important for players to go overseas, especially in their like early uh, careers. If they're not really playing that much, it's it's just for me. It was always about just wanting to be playing. So our off season is just so long. Um, you know, if athletes unlimited didn't exist, I probably would still be going overseas because I just love playing. Like I mm -hmm. I want to be on the court. I want to be in the gym. And I think seven months is like an absurd amount of time to just not play. Um, so the, I would just say the biggest difference is I think the competition, like top to bottom is higher at AU, obviously, um, you know, in Europe, you know, you might have, you might find one or two teams that are like super, super talented, but mm -hmm. for the most part, their whole rosters, you know, aren't, you know, the great, greatest athletes, you know, they're not always super big. Um, but as a player, like you are like the center point of your team when you're overseas usually mm -hmm. so you know that's really fun to get a lot of reps get your confidence up you're not coming out of the game ever so <laughs> um it's a good experience and it's a good way to get your confidence but with AU it's just like a very unique um opportunity and the, the way that it's player ran and player led it just it gives you a completely new perspective of the game mm -hmm. and uh Rotating teams every week is also really interesting. It's funny explaining it to people. They're like, what do you mean you guys rotate teams? And I'm like, yeah, like it's just 44 of us. So right. um, you know, moving forward, I think we're going to have more of like a, a long-term plan. You know, I'm a member of the, the executive committee um, still last year. I was also, and we kind of were planning like year by year. Um, and just now with the explosion of like the popularity of the college players and NIL, I just feel like there's just, there's a, plan that we can put in place to, you know, help those players continue to build their brands and their skills and not have to leave the United States. So mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest thing is, you know, now these girls are coming out of college with endorsement deals and brand smart sp sponsorships and partnerships. Right. And, you know, they don't want to jet off to Europe for eight months. And, and they don't have to in, in ways that, or, you know, even five years ago, some of, you know, W players had to make a living, right? It wasn't, it wasn't a, co a le comfort. It was a necessity. Yeah. It was a necessity and like no shade to these girls, but like they're all not going to make the WNBA and that is completely okay. But we want to mm -hmm. provide a space for them, you know, to be able to stay stateside and still be professional athletes and mm -hmm. still build their brand and their skill set and maybe potentially get to the WNBA, you know, if right. they, they get cut or they don't get drafted. Um, so I'm just really excited. You know, I don't know how long I'm going to continue to play in AU, but, you know, I always want to be involved. And I think it's mm -hmm. something that's really special through all the sports that we have in Athletes Unlimited. So right. I'm just really happy to be a part of it. I was really excited <laughs> to be like one of the first players on board. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Natasha Cloud was really the first basketball player, the first W player, and she brought mm -hmm. me on immediately. So I'm always going to be grateful for her, but I'm just really excited for, you know, AU moving forward. And it's such a unique opportunity, like you you mentioned, is that it's player led. And you have talked about having some interest in being a general manager one day, whether that's the NBA, the WNBA. So this was an opportunity for you to really dip your toes into that a little bit, making um, you know, team decisions and and coaching and things like that. 
Um, what did you learn from, from having to make those decisions and from having to kind of put that, um, that lens on? Yeah. I think the biggest thing I learned was just coaching is hard and <laughs> yeah. I'd never wanted to be a coach. I definitely don't want to be one now. <laughs> and I just have found a new respect for them and how they manage game and how they manage their, their players, because, you know, you're not going to be able to make everybody happy, but you can mm-hmm. still make everybody feel valued. And I think that that was one of the most important things that I learned. And then I was like kind of thinking back on other coaches that I've had in the past. And I'm just like, it's not hard to make all your players feel valuable, like even if they're not playing. So I was kind of like, okay, these coaches, you know, why are they acting the way they act? It's not that hard to make your your, your team, your team feel valuable and important to what's mm-hmm. going on. So that was like the most important part for me. Um, but this past season, you know, I, didn't, I was never a captain. So, um, you know, I got a completely different perspective of AU from last year where I was like the captain the entire time. So mm-hmm. um, now being in the PC and becoming the chairperson of the PEC, I feel like I have a really wide understanding and lens of what we need to do moving forward to continue to make this like a positive experience for everybody. That's awesome. And you talk about, you've mentioned confidence a few times, and I think with being valued as a player that that can boost confidence right so even if you're not playing to feel valued you know that there there's you're bringing something to the table um you've had your own journey with confidence in the league um possibly before i'm i'm not sure but um you know talk about that roller coaster and, and how you were able to get to where you are now um you know four t- four teams five years like that's not easy to kind of plant your feet and keep chasing the goal with, um, the same like passion that you have. No, I mean, and I had moments like that, that season where I I got cut from Chicago, you know, that was like, it was, it was very devastating to me when that happened. You know, Mm -hmm. I think I was already dealing with getting cut from Minnesota, like right before training camp, like without even getting a conversation from anybody in the organization, you know, that just kind of, that like hurt my feelings. Mm -hmm. Then like, after I got out of my feelings, I was like, okay, well, obviously this was a business decision. So then I go to Chicago and, you know, I get cut again and I'm just kind of like, y'all, y'all saw me get waved. And then you brought me here and like, with no, and like in hindsight, we found out like they didn't really have the money to even have me on the team anyway. So it was just kind of like adding insult to injury. And I'm yeah, like, like, what are you doing? Bring me here. I could have went somewhere else. Um, but I mean, I have to like give credit to my parents because they never really let me get too low ever, but they also never really allowed me to get too high. You know, you're in, you're a senior in college, you know, you're one of the best players in the country. You're on the top of the world. You just got drafted you know, you, you arrive to training camp and you just like lost and just confused and you just feel mm-hmm. like really young um, and just inexperienced and, you know, just dealing with that um, and not really having a role on your team. And that's kind of what I dealt with in, in Connecticut and just trying to figure it out. And I think that's mm-hmm. why it was so important for me to go overseas and gain that confidence back. And then, you know, mm-hmm getting traded to Minnesota and I had a a really good second year and a lot of people don't really remember my second season because so much drama has happened from between year two and now um but you know year two I you know really felt like I was finding my footing um Mm -hmm. and then COVID COVID happened you know that was kind of obviously basketball so unimportant compared to all the other devastating things that happened during the pandemic but you know that kind of threw everybody off a little bit but definitely Mm -hmm. you know we played in the bubble you know that was an interesting experience Mm -hmm. but um you know just being being locked in you know like I said I just love basketball so much so it was never hard for me to continue to work and continue to be in the gym um and just stay positive as positive as I could but at the end of the day I knew if, if it came down to me out having to like work outwork somebody or prove it like just on the court, like I knew I was going to be fine. So Mm -hmm. that was always my mentality. And my parents always kept me very grounded. And I remember when I got cut from Chicago, Coach Wade was like, be ready because like, there is a chance that we like, we'll bring you back later. And I was like, whatever, James. So, but in my mind, I was like, I got to go home and get like, stay in the gym and blah, blah, blah. My mom was like, no, Lexi, like go enjoy your summer. Like, 
go enjoy yourself. Like you can work out when you feel like it, but like you haven't had a free summer like in 10 years since college. Mm -hmm. So she's like, go enjoy yourself. And I did, I went to Miami with my with one of my best friends who lives there. I stayed at her place and got in the gym when I could. And then literally got, I was in Miami when I got the call and he was like, can you be in Chicago tomorrow? And I was like, well, I'm in Miami, but I can go to Atlanta and gather my things and come to Chicago. So, you know, that was a whirlwind, you know, 24 hours. And, you know, the next day to air two, I was on the court playing in a game against Phoenix. So it was, wow. it was, it was, it was a whirlwind for sure, but you got to stay ready. And that's, you know, that's really the, the definition of the WNBA is like, just stay ready and be mm -hmm. ready when the numbers called. And so you mentioned your parents a few times here. Um, what was their influence early on? I mean, for those who don't know, your dad had a very successful career in the NBA. Um, your mom also played in college, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so, so did you feel pressured to play at first? Like, did they introduce you to it? Did they let you find it on your own? How did that talk to me about how, what that looked like? Yeah. I mean, my parents, obviously they're, they're both athletes. So we were very active as kids. So I pretty much did every sport possible, softball, soccer, gymnastics. Like I was doing everything. Um, and I do say like, I, I fell in love with basketball because it's what my dad did. And I just love spending time with him. So like there was that, but, um, I like had a really, really tight, close group of girls and like that lived around where we lived. And we just like all of our parents got along, like we all got along. It was like eight of us. And we just decided to like make a basketball team. <laughs> so from like, I would say maybe like fourth grade to like eighth grade, like this was just our team. And it was just like random girls from Windermere, Florida, where we lived, you know, none of them play basketball anymore. Not a single one. Really? Uh, but me. <laughs> So it was just like literally my little group of friends and we just like, and my dad was just such a, he's just such a good coach trainer. So my dad would just come in and train us all. And like, it was, it's funny now that I'm in flag. I haven't talked about this team like ever, but like we were horrible. Like we were terrible. And then we just keep kept getting better and better and better. And it was just like, we worked so hard. Like, it was funny, like none of these girls wanted to play basketball professionally. I don't even think any of them played college basketball. Like it was just something that we did like as friends and it just, we just grew, we grew up together basically. And then, you know, I just kind of, you know, separated myself a little bit and ended up like going to a different team. And then, you know, the rest is history, but you know, that friendship like group kind of is what like made me fall in love like a lot with basketball. Cause I'm like, look at like, all the amazing things and people and experiences you have, you know, playing this team sport. And I really love tennis. Tennis was actually my first love. Okay. But it was just too much one-on-one -on -one time. Like mm -hmm. I do like, like the camaraderie team. that yeah. the team. and like, yeah, I trained with other players, but it's still like an individual sport. And I was just mm -hmm. like, like, I don't like this as much as basketball, but sometimes mm -hmm. I like when I'm looking at like Serena and Naomi Osaka and, and Sharapova and like mm -hmm. how much money they make and all that and all the Louis Vuitton ads. I'm like, dang, I probably maybe should have, you know, stuck with it. <laughs> but hey, no, there's I'm always not. a second life. There's always a second no, life. You're athletic. <laughs> I said my daughter is playing tennis. If, I, if I'm blessed to have a daughter, she is playing tennis. I don't care what she says. So, um, but yeah, like that was, that was the process and the journey. I never felt pressure. And I think yeah. that's why you know, I love the game so much. And so your dad coached you and trained you and um, was there, what, I, I mean, we, we, I, I think Kobe kind of introduced us to this idea of the girl dad and, and encouraging. And, and when I say introduced us, I mean, like broadly, I think that has right. existed. Right. Um, how did you feel that having a dad or parents, but specifically a dad support you in women's sports and to, you know, lift you up and say like, and not compare you to the dudes and all of that really just lift you up in the sport yeah I think it, it was so important and mm -hmm. it was nice because I also had like a lot of my teammates who had dads that were like very involved with like our basketball and our team and stuff like mm -hmm. that and you know growing up I thought that was normal like that's not normal to have mm -hmm. you know a parent that is like just supportive like obviously yeah they were hard on us he was hard on me but you know I've heard some horrible stories from 
you know, yeah. my friends about their parents and how they treat them and how they speak to them and just all the pressure that they they threw on them, you know, growing mm-hmm. up. So, you know, I, when Kobe and Gigi, like when all that girl dad stuff started coming out, me and my dad were like, look, it's us. <laughs> like they're doing exactly like Kobe having that little group of girls, you know, with Gigi, Gigi being like the best player on the team. But those girls just, you know, working really hard, you know, Kobe just taking care of all those girls and, mm-hmm. you know, making them confident and, you know, just making them better every single day. And like my Kobe's with his Mamba Academy, like my dad had a facility in Orlando, like that's mm-hmm. where we would practice at. Like it was just very, it was really amazing to see, you know, people seeing it like globally Mm -hmm. and worldwide and that whole girl dad thing coming you know up so you know I think that Kobe really like stamped that and I think like obviously girl dads have like they've always existed like men have always had daughters and yeah yeah you know having girls that are interested in sports like it's not like oh why doesn't she want to do cheerleading or why doesn't she want to be an artist or why is she Mm -hmm. like so into sports like it's not really stigmatized anymore like like men are like proud when they have like daughters that like are, are beating all the boys in every yeah. sense and everything like they're not like why is she like this yeah so it's like nice to see that and you know I just think that you know girls just got to be confident and you know your dad is your first love so when you have that you know from him I think it's everything what is it like when when he's at games oh, I love when he comes to games and last year he only came to one and he came with my brother um so I love and he always sits courtside and mm-hmm. he's always right there um and I just see him with his phone out like just <laughs> recording I'm like dad you see me shoot every day of my life like you do not have to record everything but he's so adorable and growing up like he just he is very quiet so you know mm-hmm. he doesn't yell if I didn't like run up to him and give him a big hug people probably wouldn't even know he was in the gym so like mm-hmm. he's very reserved and very proud of us and he kind of just lets us have our moment so you know I love when he comes to games hopefully this season he'll be able to come to more uh, Mm -hmm. you know not just in LA I like when he comes to road games too so yeah yeah do you ever lean on him now like for for pointers or things like that do you have like a pregame do you like text him before after the game or is there anything that you lean on him for um I mean I get texts from him before the game so me me my mom and my dad are in a group chat Mm -hmm. so I get my little pregame text from them. And then sometimes at, at halftime, I'll like take a quick look at my phone and he'll have some like halftime notes that he sent me. Um, and then after the game, like, it's funny, like we have like an understanding, like if I had like a horrible game, like they won't text, like they won't yeah. text, like they know, like if I had like, if I'm visibly upset, like I know I play bad and it was like kind of like, it was just like an off shooting night or mm-hmm. something like that like they'll be like next game like just focus on the next game but yeah. if it's like I'm just like out of it and I everything that I'm doing is just not me like then I'll have like a nice a nice little text waiting like yeah. go to the white seat so um but we know like he, they know exactly what to say um even sometimes when I don't want to hear it and you know I think that's really important too I think that comes from having, you know, they're, they're both athletes. They have that, they understand, right. What it's when you need it, when you don't, cause there's always, you always hear the stories, right. Of like the parent that texts like, good game, honey, you can get them next time. And you're like, yeah. no. you're like uh, I was <laughs> over 5,000, please. Like, don't lie to me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so when you, when you are training in the, in the off season and you're preparing or, or even before games now, how do you lock in? How do you stay focused on do you look at like a season ahead do you focus on a specific like one game at a time like what's the approach that you have it really and it really depends like on our schedule because you know we there are times in our season where we're playing like every other day so you kind of have to like make sure you have a routine down and I think that's going to be like the biggest step I'm going to have to take as a professional uh Mm -hmm. this season is just like establishing a routine that I do that everybody around knows that I do. So like when I get to the gym, everyone knows, oh, Lexi's going to be here at this Mm -hmm. time. She's going to do this at that time. And I haven't really been able to do that yet. So I'm like actually very looking forward to having a routine that I can do during practice, during game day. So like you said, like if it's, we have like looking ahead for the season or looking ahead for the game, like nothing I do is going to change. Like just the opponent is changing. And obviously the scouting report 
we have to do our, our homework on the other team, but mm-hmm. I just want to be able to be locked in and do the same thing. And, you know, I think that's something that I did a lot in college. I had a very mm-hmm. strict routine every game day that I always did. And, you know, and that matters. And sometimes as a young player, you don't understand how important a routine is. So, mm-hmm. you know, growing up and maturing a little bit, I'm, I'm realizing how important that is. So, you know, just maintaining that, I think is going to be really, really helpful. What did that routine, like, what did your college routine entail that you want to bring in to this season's routine? Just like being on the court, like, at like pretty much like the same time doing, getting mm-hmm. the same shots up you know, getting up shots that like I'm going to take in the game, not really like last season, I'll say like in our pre sh- pregame shooting, like we were in groups that like didn't really make sense all the time. So like yeah. sometimes I was taking shots that I shouldn't take, be taking and my teammates were like practicing shots that they really shouldn't be taking. Like it's okay to like get up some of those shots, but right. like the entire like workout being something that you're not going to do in a game ever, like probably wasn't the best thing for us to do. Um, you know, stretching, um, you know, I get a, like a little snack in between, you know, just take your time, you know, we have to be at the gym so early. So just having that and just have, making sure that everybody's on the same page also. Um, and yeah. And I think finally I get to be like a priority in the training room. So it's like, that's going to be fun to like get stretched and, and taped and all that before everybody else, mm-hmm. because I'm one of the veterans. So it's going to be nice to tell the rookie to move aside. (laughs) (laughs) Wait, you got to wait your turn. I love that. Something else that I know you've talked about that I think is really, is really important when we talk about women's sports is just kind of embracing the feminine side. And I know that you always have your nails done for games. And yeah. So talk to me about that. And cause I think something that like people shy away from talking about sometimes because they have to be an athlete. It's like, no, an athlete can be, yeah, you can be both. (laughs) And it's like, there's just this stigma of the WNBA. Like, there's just like, there's just like no feminine women in it at all. Um, And even the ones that like, don't necessarily look feminine, like still are, like there are some that like may not traditionally look feminine, but like they are still very much feminine. Um, And I think like, that's, that's the hard part about being a woman. Like you're just judged off of your looks like immediately. And then Mm -hmm. people make assumptions from there, but um, for me, I, I mean, I grew up, I was a tomboy till about like age 14. Like I was wearing like basketball shorts to school and slides mm-hmm. and my hair was always in a bun. So, you know, one day I kind of just, I feel like everybody has their own journey of, you mm-hmm. know, finding who, out who they are and discovering themselves. And, you know, I slowly shied away from that tomboy stuff. You know, I still have tomboy like clothes like I'll still wear like cargo pants and like shorts like I still my style I would say is still like kind of like in between girly and, and tomboy but um for me like even growing up I wasn't allowed to like do makeup I wasn't mm-hmm. allowed to have my nails done I wasn't allowed to do any of that growing up but you know I watched my mom do her hair makeup whatever and she's right. she's a natural girly though so it wasn't always a lot but you know, right when I hit that college campus when I got my first <laughs> check from the school I went straight to the nail salon and got my nails done um and then I started you know being able to get my hair done I started wearing lashes my senior year of college so the girls are kind of wearing them a little young now but um you know I just think that they're so cute and they make you know your day easier Mm -hmm. um but it's always important to me to just be myself yeah um and I'm seeing a lot more players embracing their feminine side especially you know at the college level Mm -hmm. um so I love to see that and it's Mm -hmm. it's being celebrated more because it used to be like oh, she's girly. Oh, she must not like, she must not be good. One, that's mm-hmm. the first assumption is you're not good. And then two, like, oh, she's focused on her looks or whatever. She doesn't, she probably doesn't work hard because she doesn't care. Um, and I think all of those, you know, stigmas and assumptions are, are slowly going away. And I love mm-hmm. that because you can be both. You can be girly and you can be a badass on the court. Like it's, it's not one or the other. You can be both. So yeah. I'm really glad that, you know, more players and and are being recognized you know for their their feminine you know energy but again the ones that don't have the most feminine energy like they should be celebrated too and like they Mm -hmm. shouldn't be looked at in a negative way 
I used to preach in my lot, preach. I used to just go around yelling in my locker room. I was like, look good, feel good, play good guys. That's all that And that means a different thing to everybody, but. Exactly. We had some girls that would just be totally like, like, like makeup, nails, hair, everything. Others were just like, throw their hair in a bun and go. And yeah. you know what? That's they fine. all performed the way that they needed to. Exactly. Um, so I want to ask about the W and the growth and what, from your seat, what needs to happen for this game to continue to grow? I think we're seeing it head the right direction, but like anything, the momentum, we need to keep fueling, right. fueling it to keep growing. So from your, from your seat, what needs to happen? Um, well, actually just talking about this yesterday, um, with Gilbert Arenas actually, cause I was on his podcast and we were just talking about, cause they, they, so, you know, there's a conversation of like letting the college players come sooner mm -hmm. Cause that's going to uh, impact the viewership. And I'm like, well, if they're not in college building their viewership, then what are they going to bring to the pros? If yeah. they're missing out this entire time to build their brands and, and their confidence and their fan bases, right. right? You're taking that away completely and throwing them into the, the league where you think is like the most horrible place on earth. So like that doesn't make your argument doesn't make sense for me, I think. And what I saw um with the college season this year is just like storytelling and I think that's why we love AU because it's they're big on storytelling mm -hmm. like there needs to be like some rivalries in the W there needs to be some stories that may not be the most flower positive we love everybody stories but like you don't have to like diminish anybody's game or character but people like drama and I hate that but like that's just what the world is the NBA is drama every day drama 24 7 mm -hmm. but they go on the court and they perform and they put the ball in the basket and they're all friends at the end and everything's cool it's professional sports it's entertainment mm -hmm. and I think for us like we are so focused on like just being like extremely family friendly which is fine you know I love that the fact that people want to bring their kids and stuff to the games but it's mm -hmm. like Cup, like sugar coat cupcake everything when like there are some like there are some like little mini rivalries throughout the league you know if a player gets traded from a team like that's a story like if the the aces doing what they did and liberty doing what they did like i'm waiting for the w to be like this is the story of the season these are the first like super teams that have been built in free agency and who's going to be the better super team like that's like the easiest story that you could go with this. It's season. writing itself this season. Like right there. <laughs> so I'm just waiting on that. You know, I know players are going to be like annoyed by it because like, okay, they're super team. Woohoo. But like, you have to deal with that. And then you can be the team that takes down the super team. Like it's just, there's just so many possibilities for mm -hmm. storytelling. And I think that's the biggest thing that the, the W is missing. And then it's just like, anytime they, something gets a little spicy, they just immediately want it to like go away. Mm -hmm. when really like those are the things that they should be leaning into because at the end of the day we're all professionals mm -hmm. and we know this is entertainment um and it's how we you know make money and we want to have a good time on the court as well like we don't need everything to be like perfect g-rated all the time and I think that's like the hump that we're missing and then obviously mm -hmm. just putting us on tv more mm -hmm. um you know, but we don't have any control of that right now but yeah um, you know you put things on television you, you put things out for people to consume that they, they will consume it so mm -hmm. I mean, I think we're headed in the right direction. I think, um, you know, us as players, we put out a great product. I think Kathy's doing the best that she can. You know, some people mm -hmm. are not super big fans or high on Kathy, but I think she's like really making amazing strides for this league. Yeah. And, you know, I think we're, we're headed in the right direction. I think it's going to be good. I mean, you just need to add a little spice. I like that. Add a, a little, little spice. spice to it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Well, I'm loving this conversation, Lexi. I think there's just so much to dive into with you. Um, and I want to ask you one final question. I ask everyone when things get tough, what's your mantra? What do you lean on? When things get tough. Um, dang, I don't know. I'm not going to, I don't think I have a mantra, but like, sometimes I'm like, oh no, I guess I'll be like, if it's not going to matter in five, five years, it's not going to matter in five minutes. You need to just get over it. That's one. And then another thing I do is like, if I'm struggling, I'm like, just take a nap. And wake up the second person that has said that i absolutely <laughs> we're love gonna that. take a nap and we're gonna wake up 
and see if you wake up and that's the first thing you're thinking about, then okay, we're going to move forward. But if you take a nap and you wake up and like it's at the back of your mind, then it's not as important as you think it is. That's so, amazing. Yes. I love that. <laughs> Well, Lexi, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, I'd love for you to come back and chat more. We are like just scratching, scratching the surface. Yes, I'd love to come back. I told you I love podcasts. So amazing. If you want to chat, just let me know. <laughs> we'll have you back soon. And good luck this season. I'm excited for you. And we'll be thank we'll be you. cheering for you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.